Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, a quick note that we are recording and that the recording will be published on our YouTube channel, History at Newcastle. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, wherever we may be located, and pay, our, uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and in particular to the Pambalong clan of the Awabagal people of the land in which the Callaghan campus resides and where we in the room are located today. Our speaker, Peter Hooker, completed his PhD here at the University of Newcastle. He specializes in maritime history from the 18th to 20th centuries, and his PhD thesis examined American maritime prisoners of war during the War of 1812. He has previously contributed to the British Library James Cook, the, the Voyagers exhibit, and has devoted his time to the Australian National Maritime Museum in Sydney. His paper today stems from his doctoral research and is titled, Given Up from the Royal Navy, Reconsidering American Sailors in the British Royal Navy During the War of 1812. Peter, over to you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Okay. Uh, so this paper is partly derived from my PhD thesis, which explored ideas of nationalism, identity, and the experience of American maritime prisoners uh, during the revolutionary era, with a particular focus on the War of 1812. Today, I want to focus on a particular group of American prisoners of war uh, who arrived in British prison facilities, not through, uh, I guess, what we would call conventional means, either from the battlefield or from uh, an engagement with uh, an American warship, uh, but rather arrived uh, in, in prisoner of war facilities uh, from the decks of, Briti of, of the Royal Navy uh, during and throughout the War of 1812. And this was the second conflict between Britain uh, and the United States. What I want to really look at is uh, the experience of these men who served in the Royal Navy during uh, the conflict with the United States and uh, firstly look at how uh, they came to arrive in uh, prisoner of war facilities. The conventional narrative runs that these men effectively surrendered themselves uh, as Americans uh, upon hearing of the outbreak of war and either were accepted by the British officers as American citizens and therefore placed in a prisoner of war facility, uh, or had their, uh, their surrender, I uh, should put it in inverted commas, their surrender, refused uh, and were told to uh, do duty or face a potential uh, flogging if they didn't. Uh, what I want to look at is that, uh, is the more uh, complex and variety of ways in which uh, these men came to either surrender themselves or end up in prisoner of war facilities and also look at how their uh, service in the Royal Navy uh, impacted, uh, impacted upon and reflected uh, their loyalties uh, surrounding the United States and how this impacted and affected their concept of loyalty and identity uh, within that particular context. Uh, key to the context of this paper, however, is the British practice of pressing sailors into service on board the Royal Navy. Impressment, in effect, was a method of recruitment used by the Royal Navy to coerce sailors uh, into joining the service by violence if necessary. Although this paper is not about impressment itself, it does definitely underpin uh, much of what I'm going to discuss here. Uh, it is important to point out that my, there is still much debate uh, about the practice of impressment, what forms it took, uh, its legitimacy, uh, and the justifications uh, around it. But it's also something that has entered into, uh, I guess, a kind of popular imagery as well. Uh, and here we have on the slide uh, a contemporary image, actually, of uh, a caricature, I should say, of impressment. Uh, we have a British officer there on the right patting the head of an innkeeper who he seems to be hand, holding out his hand, uh, hoping for cash, for having given up a sailor, a drunken sailor who's being beaten and dragged to one of the uh, awaiting warships in the background. Although the press gang did operate during this time, rarely was there instances of sailors being beaten and forced in onto British warships. Usually a financial incentives, accusations of desertion, or a simple order brought sailors to the decks of Royal Navy ships. And if nothing else, a sailor's keenness for drink and a patriotic innkeeper could also suffice to bring a sailor into the wooden world walls of a man of war. 
As I said before, impressment has become a bit of a staple of popular uh, imagery concerning the Royal Navy. Uh, one of the most famous uh, and enduring uh, images of, the, of that is the, uh, is the infamous uh, Bounty Mutiny and the film, uh, the first film of the Bounty, which depicted uh, Bly not only impressing sailors on board the Bounty, but having them flogged and notoriously even flogging, uh, continuing to flog a sailor after he had died from a flogging. Uh, it's a complete myth. No sailor was ever impressed on board the Bounty and Bly was actually uh, not prone to using the lash uh, throughout his entire service. Uh, in the Royal Navy. Nonetheless, this image has endured um, quite a bit. But it is also important to point out that the practice was quite controversial, even amongst contemporaries. Um, this image is from 1780, uh, and it doesn't point a particularly flattering view of, of impressment at all. Indeed, historians have argued that impressment was one of the leading causes of tensions between Britain and its 13 colonies that culminated in the War of Independence. Incensed by the tendency of the Royal Navy to send a press gang into the colonies to prey on skilled sailors who underpin the colony's merchant trade and a general unwillingness on the part of officials back in London to, to address their concerns, many colonists did indeed loathe impressment. After the conclusion of the War of Independence in 1783, the matter appeared to be, at least in theory, settled. Americans were sovereign citizens of a separate nation and therefore could not be subject to the press. In reality, however, there was no clear means to distinguish between Britons and Americans. The issue was further complicated by American sailors signing up to sail on board foreign vessels, including British merchant ships for employment and profit, and vice versa on the part of British sailors joining American vessels. When war broke out between Britain and revolutionary France in 1793, the press gang resumed their notorious operations, both on land and at sea. Still lacking a definitive means of telling Americans and Britons apart, and with the knowledge that many British sailors fled to American vessels as British subjects, uh, many Royal Navy captains took the initiative in stopping and searching American vessels uh, for deserters and British subjects. Methods of ascertaining the true identity of sailors were crude at best. For instance, one British officer justified taking four men from an American vessel by claiming, and I quote, they speak better English than I do. <laughs> Another British officer pressed a sailor on board an American ship based on the testimony of an alleged former wife who had not seen her husband for 20 years. In desperation, the United States government issued certificates to authenticate the identity of its sailors. Other documents such as birth certificates were also utilized by sailors to try and avoid being pressed. However, the tendency for paperwork to be falsified, sold off, to sailors looking to make a new life or simply misplaced hardly helped the situation. And in certain instances, American agents also hindered a sailor's ability to prove his identity. Peyton Page was seized by the press gang while looking for work in England in 1808. When his protection certificate was refused, he demanded to see the American consul, only for the consul to refuse to believe that he was an American. Page thus found himself serving in, Brit in, in Britain in its war with France. It was nearly inevitable that tensions quickly arose between Britain and the United States. In the years leading up to the War of 1812, Britain's apparent disregard for American sovereignty and the rights of its citizens fed increasing tensions between the two countries. Indeed, by the outbreak of the War of 1812, somewhere between, and the estimates are quite rough due to a lack of documents, but most people estimate somewhere between 6,000 to 10,000 American sailors had been placed on board uh, uh, Royal Navy vessels. American sailors quickly became potent symbols of the sovereignty and rights of the United States, as well as its citizenry. As Secretary of State John Marshall declared in December 1800, the impressment of our seamen is an injury of very serious magnitude, which deeply affects the feelings and honor of the nation. Finally, the United States made its first de official declaration of war against another country in June 1812, with President James Madison declaring that, quote, Thousands of American citizens under the safeguard of public law and their national flag have been torn from their country to fight in foreign navies. And by this stage, as I said, somewhere between six to 10,000 Americans uh, occupied British warships. Generally, the scholarship concerning impressment and American sailors uh, serving in the Royal Navy more broadly ends with the declaration of war by the United States. References to Amer any American sailors then serving in the Royal Navy fall broadly into two characterizations. 
either American sailors surrendered themselves as American citizens uh, to their British officers who, not wishing to harbour a potential enemy uh, in their crew, accepted the surrender and had the sailors removed and sent to a prison facility. In other instances, the sailors' surrender was refused and the individual would be threatened with a flogging for insubordination if they did not do their duty. However, what I want to stress here is that these two characterizations greatly oversimplify the experience of Americans serving in the Royal Navy and that uh, Americans who were impressed into service uh, has also greatly overshadowed the variety of uh, uh, men who served in the Royal Navy during this period. Uh, this is not, however, to um, downplay in any way uh, that men uh, were coerced into serving in the Royal Navy uh, and did indeed um, try to escape from the Royal Navy right through until the War of 1812 and after uh, and were met with quite a lot of difficulty. For example, Samuel Dalton was pressed into service in 1803 and served 11 years in the British Royal Navy. In 1813, after almost a decade of trying to prove his identity, Dalton finally received recognition of his status as an American citizen from the British Admiralty. Writing directly to the British government from HMS Picanti, Dalton proclaimed, quote, being a citizen of the United States of America, I made frequent applications for my discharge, including presenting evidence of citizenship in the form of birth certificates, witness testimony, and letters from relatives. Dalton believed that, quote, as the two countries are now at war with each other, the government of Great Britain could have no objections to grant me my discharge or consider me as a prisoner of war. His belief paid off, though it must have been a bittersweet moment for Dalton as he was taken from the ship uh, to a British prison depot at Malta. From his prison at Malta, Dalton wrote to his mother that, quote, I have for companions several of my countrymen that the fortune of war has placed in the same situation as myself. He also wrote to her that he and his fellow countrymen were keen to exact revenge against the tyrant of the oceans, that being the British. Dalton certainly fits the trope of an American sailor in the British Royal Navy during this period. And many historians have um, drew upon such um, narratives as his uh, when looking into, in, into these men. According, according rather to Paul Gile, these men carry deep resentments either because they've been impressed or because as volunteers, they believe their dismissal from the Navy only to be sent to Dartmoor, which was a prisoner of war depot that harbored the most uh, Americans during the war, uh, during demobilization reflected British ingratitude for years of service. And the argument then follows that uh, that experience of either being forced into the Royal Navy uh, or basically having their service disregarded, um, reinforced or validated uh, uh, many uh, sailors' views of being an American uh, and their attachment to the United States. Impressed into service against his will, Dalton tried repeatedly to leave the Royal Navy, though he was only able to do so at the outbreak of war with the United States. He felt certainly uh, personally wronged by his treatment and expressed a clear desire to exact revenge on the part of the British and uh, repeatedly declared his loyalty uh, and devotion to the United States. He would not get his chance for revenge, however. Released at the end of the war in 1815, Dalton returned to sea and died only a few years later. Nonetheless, men like Dalton were conspicuous in the span of British prisons where Americans were detained from 1812 until 1815. Francis Selman, an American prisoner of war, recorded in his journal kept during his time on board the prison transport Talbot, uh, recorded, quote, we found that there were four Americans on board that were impressed, that had frequently given themselves up as Americans, but were always flogged and made to do duty. And he also listed their names as, quote, William Higgins of New London, William McCarthy of Penobscot River, Thomas Hudson, a black man of Boston, and Peter Martin, a mulatto of Virginia. Dolan and these other men again fit the standard characterization of impressed Americans loyal, assertive, and unwilling to serve against their fellow countrymen during the war, which continues to characterize the popular image of impressed Americans during the conflict. The actual experience of American mariners did not always fit this imagery, however, of the American public both then and now. It is true, as I said, that many of the American prisoners of war throughout the conflict were former servicemen to the Royal Navy, and many did express resentment or desires for revenge against the British. This does not, however, necessarily represent the standard journey for American sailors in the Royal Navy. Obadiah Stevens was one of seven Americans 
who as a group surrendered themselves as prisoners of war upon hearing of the conflict between Britain and the United States. Like Dalton, they too were accepted as, Amer as Americans in spite of their initial impressment into the Royal Navy as British subjects. The seven were also sent to Malta, where it seems likely that Stevens and Dalton crossed paths. On the 10th of April, 1813, Stevens recorded in his journal the quote, Samuel M. Dalton confined in the Cashco, which was solitary confinement. On the surface, Stevens' experience appears to reinforce the general view of Americans serving in the Royal Navy at this time. An impressed sailor, Stevens was given up from the Royal Navy at the outbreak of war and placed into captivity. Read carefully, however, his journal represents a far more complex view of how American sailors experienced service in the Royal Navy, as well as their captivity. It appears that Stevens and his ilk did not endure a long drawn out affair to validate their identity like Dalton. Uh, and it seems that Stevens uh, and his fellows didn't even possess a protection certificate. They merely surrendered themselves as Americans and had it immediately accepted. Perhaps most curiously, unlike Dalton, Stevens' journal appears to express little resentment towards the British for the time he served in the Royal Navy. In fact, Stephen provides more condemnation to the French and Italian prisoners who harassed the newly arrived Americans and notes that he and his compatriots petitioned officers of the Royal Navy, as well as the Admiralty itself, for aid while in captivity, often seeking a transfer to another prison or separation from their European counterparts. This may of course have been due to the lack of an American consul or agent on the island. Nonetheless, seeking assistance from the Admiralty certainly indicates their willingness to use their former service to achieve their own ends. Furthermore, it is striking that unlike other former servicemen from the Royal Navy, Stevens does not appear to have used his time uh, in the service as a reason to request early release from captivity. This could be due to the willingness of the Admiralty to pay prize money owed to former servicemen, and this did include prisoners of war, or reflect a highly pragmatic response from Stevens to his fellow servants, to his service and captivity. Indeed, his ability to form networks amongst his fellow prisoners and as well as sailors in addition to his willingness to take advantage of his former service in the Royal Navy, as well as his American citizenship, showcases the ways in which Americans serving in the Royal Navy, even impressed sailors, could still exercise a significant degree of agency and take advantage of their situations. Many impressed as well as volunteer Americans serving in the Royal Navy carefully weighed the pros and cons of continued service in the Royal Navy, even throughout the war. In some instances, it appears that American mariners carefully chose the moment when they surrendered themselves as, as prisoners. In October 1812, the American agent for prisoners of war, Reuben Beasley, sent a request to the Admiralty for an inquiry into the status of nine men in British service who claimed to be Americans, one of whom was John Ballard. In their response, the Admiralty claimed that Ballard had surrendered himself when the crew were at quarters and preparing for action against the large American vessels, a moment the Admiralty claimed was, quote, highly improper for refusing to obey his officer's commands. And the Ballard also appeared to be drunk. Furthermore, the ship in which he served had previously taken three American vessels, and at no time in these past circumstances, it was claimed, did he surrender himself. Finally, although Ballard was able to produce a protection certificate that described the bearer as having a fair complexion with blue eyes, Ballard had a dark complexion with dark eyes. <laughs> basis, his submission as, a, as an American citizen was refused. William Johnson and Richard Norris served in the Royal Navy until 1815 and only gave themselves up as Americans just before the inaction between the ship they were serving on and the USS President. Both men had their surrender refused because the ship was preparing for imminent action, but they were later discharged from the service for being a foreigner. Conveniently, this took place after the war. In another instance, three men of color surrendered themselves as Americans while serving on board HMS Denmark in January 1814, having served on the ship since the 1st of October 1812. They were sent to Dartmoor Prison where they applied for their wages for service in the Royal Navy and their former commander, Lieutenant Robert Fordner, confirmed their service and thus it seems likely that they received their pay. Once again, we see formerly impressed Americans using their service in the Royal Navy and the contacts they made to pursue their own agendas. Indeed, the first abdication of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1814 saw many sailors discharged from the Royal Navy. Hardly by coincidence, an upsurge of American prisoners formerly from the Royal Navy arrived in British prisons during this period. Perhaps lacking further employment, they calculated on a short, on a short captivity and a free passage back to the United States. 
Unsurprisingly, news of peace between Britain and the United States in December 1814 was also soon accompanied by the arrival of still more prisoners formerly serving in the Royal Navy, who had only now chosen to give themselves up. Unlike the other prisoners who arrived from the Royal Navy, these late arrivals did not receive a warm welcome from their uh, counterparts. At Dartmoor Prison, Charles Andrews recorded that there was uh, quite a lot of scorn uh, directed towards these men, quote, for they had delayed till the act had become a willful aiding and assisting of the enemy and the mischief now over. Amongst the newly arrived men, uh, and, sorry, amongst the newly arrived were six men who had served on HMS Pelican when it went into action against the USS Argus, which was a particularly violent uh, encounter between two warships even uh, during this period. These men were caught bragging about their role in taking the Argus and indeed of uh, killing some of the crew of the Argus and that news of the peace had induced them to surrender in order to reclaim their citizenship, uh, uh, their citizenship towards the United States. Hearing this news, the prisoners sought to seize and punish the six men who were saved by the intervention of the prison depot commandant, Thomas Shortland, and sent to Plymouth. A similar event occurred when two men arrived who had served in the Royal Navy surrendered as Americans to become prisoners of war and then, re -elect and then elected to rejoin the Royal Navy before once again claiming citizenship. Returning as prisoners once more to Dartmoor in late 1814, the two men were recognized instantly and seized by the other prisoners. A trial was then held, which found the two men guilty. For punishment, some of the, some of the assembled prisoners favored a sentence of death, others flogging, Although eventually the decision was made to tattoo the men on the face with the letters US and T, meaning United States traitor. It appears in these cases that impressed men carefully chose the moment and indeed volunteers to the Royal Navy carefully chose the moment to give themselves up. John Ballard's case in particular highlights a very self-serving agenda as he willingly took part in the seizure of American prizes, likely, likely for the prize money, before giving himself up and indeed choosing the moment before surrender as uh, they were about to go into action was a moment that was quite understandably troublesome for British officers uh, as the ship was clean for action. Even the loss of a single man could, definish, could, could diminish rather the fighting efficiency of a ship. Skilled seamen were after all highly sought after and even an experienced gunner was highly valued for the fighting quality of a ship. Others only, surrender, only surrendered uh, at war's end or due to discharge from the Royal Navy. Not at all Americans serving in the Royal Navy decide to give themselves up. Henry Thomas of Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia, uh, uh, served on board HMS De Moor after volunteering for the, for the Royal Navy and at no time gave himself up in spite of possessing a protection, a protection certificate. He was discharged from the Royal Navy on the 30th of July, 1815 and refused passage back to the United States. Edward Sands and Thomas Stanley also did not give themselves up as Americans, perhaps because they lacked protection certificates, but they both served in the Royal Navy until September 1815, when they were discharged with full payment. Even Peyton Page, who I mentioned earlier, uh, who was the sailor who appealed to the American consul after he was impressed, appears to have largely accepted his fate. Although he wrote to his brother in 1812 that his service in the Royal Navy had not hindered his loyalties to the United States, he did declare his intention to quote, weather this out. Perhaps his rapid promotion to midshipman and then second master on board a 74 gun man of war uh, made weathering his service a little easier, along with the prize money of some $4,000. Nicholas Guyatt has observed that Page's letter is also not a cry for help, rather a pragmatic use of circumstances to his advantage. Indeed, Page uh, was hardly shy in writing to his brother of the money and seniority he gained as a British sailor, while unironically proclaiming his loyalty to the United States. And I think we can see in Page's experience a demonstration of the ambiguity surrounding identity and loyalty during this period. So although Americans, uh, impressed American sailors were certainly quite numerous within the ranks of the Royal Navy by 1812, making up somewhere between 6,000 to 10,000 personnel, they did not make up the entirety of American sailors who served in the British Royal Navy. Nor is it the case that impressment or even service in the Royal Navy as a volunteer robbed an American sailor of their agency. Some even saw the Royal Navy on calculation as a far better option than service in the depleted United States Merchant Service or the minuscule United States Navy. 
Finally, their experience did not necessarily clarify national identity and loyalties. Even when, when war broke out between Britain and the United States, several American sailors chose to remain in the Royal Navy for the duration of the conflict. Impressed Americans, uh, therefore, did not instantly give themselves up when learning of war between Britain and their homeland. In fact, the flow of impressed Americans into British prisons lasted until the final naval battles of the war. Sometimes the flow of men went the other way, with men rejoining the British service or simply not giving themselves up at all. Furthermore, the reason for Americans giving themselves up varied from not wanting to fight their fellow countrymen to avoiding battle, leaving the service of the British Royal Navy due to discharge, or simply because the prospect of peace offered means of getting home with pockets full of money. Furthermore, not all Americans serving in the Royal Navy were pressed into service. Some took advantage of the ambiguities concerning nationality and identity to serve both in the United States and Britain throughout the war. Uh, and I should mention this also took place on the other side with many British sailors serving in the Royal Navy to then join the United States uh, Navy in some instances or United States service to then end up back uh, on the decks of a British ship. Uh, on the slide here, we have an image of Dartmoor Depot. This is a, an earlier image. Um, it was uh, on opening in 1808, the largest and the most modern uh, prisoner of war facility in Britain uh, at this time. And uh, it still actually operates to this day as a civil jail, which you can go and uh, visit. Uh, there's even a little museum just outside the, uh, the uh, prison to, uh, to its history. Even after their, re their release from the Royal Navy, and their internment as prisoners of war, former servicemen, former Americans who had served in the Royal Navy occupied an ambig ambiguous space regarding their status uh, as both um, servicemen of the Royal Navy and citizens of the United States. Elizabeth Jones argues that these men uh, who now occupied British prison facilities constituted an existential threat to their fellow countrymen um, as their service basically undermined or threatened concepts of national identity and loyalty. The brutal punishment that awaited some of these men who had served in the Royal Navy certainly reinforces this claim, despite more sympathetic betrayals that were placed on these men uh, in retrospective accounts of imprisonment, as well as the public sympathy uh, back in the United States that galvanized uh, the country to declare war on Britain. Uh, it seems that the actual encounter with these men uh, was not quite as uh, easily translated to the sympathetic betrayals that were being seen um, at home. There was indeed suspicion, which at times reflected the prejudices of the prisoners. Guyatt notes that black sailors who became prisoners of war were twice as likely to come from the decks of the Royal Navy as their white counterparts. Yet despite, uh, yet despite very, few, very little evidence of uh, black prisoners deciding to re-enlist in the Royal Navy, many white prisoners actively accused uh, their black counterparts of resuming their former service. Even formerly impressed sailors struggled to bridge their loyalty to the United States. Some men who surrendered in the hopes of securing aid from the United States government were left dismally disappointed. In May 1813, a group of formerly impressed American sailors addressed a petition directly to, the pre to President James Madison. In the letter, they begged the president, quote, to take our case into particular consideration, who have been compelled to suffer the severest tyranny on board a British man of war for a number of years, and now deprived from returning to our own country and families and of taking our part as good citizens against the overgrown power and oppression of Britain. They claimed that their appeals to Reuben Beasley had come to nothing because he, quote, scarcely ever comes near us and never answers our letters. In reality, Beasley and other American agents were hamstrung by the desire of the British government to not make special allowance for formerly impressed Americans to be released, as well as the lack of clarity from the United States government on the power of agents to even try and secure the immediate release of former impressed Americans as prisoners of war. George Bray was another formerly impressed American who surrendered himself. In a letter to his sister from a prison ship in Chatham, Bray described his despair at seeing, quote, all other prisoners of war, except men that came out of men of war and the men that were taken up in England at the commencement of the war, get their regular exchange. Bray claimed that Beasley could apparently offer no, existent, could, could apparently offer no, no assistance uh, and lamented that they, the United States, continually keep exchanging prisoners they consist of foreigners and the subjects of the United States remain here. He told his sister that they, that being the prisoners, will not remain here much longer as they have begun to enter on board his majesty's ships already. And the remainder say if the country would sooner have foreigners than their own subjects, 
we must go from whence we came. Finally, he warned his sister that, quote, you may depend that if the States does not look into this matter before long, there will not be many men that give themselves up from men of war, nor people that was taken in England at the commencement of the war, which I believe are as able a set of men as any belonging to the United States. And some certainly did behave as Bray predicted. Morris Russell was impressed into service in June 1812, the month the war broke out between Britain and the United States. He surrendered himself as an American and was then transported to the British prison hulks before deciding to re-enlist in the Royal Navy on board the Cumberland, from which he was discharged in August 1815. Frustrated by the perceived inactivity of the United States government, some formerly impressed Americans attempted to use their service in the Royal Navy to petition the British government directly. On the 22nd of July, 1814, a group of American prisoners petitioned the House of Commons. In their petition, the prisoners set forth an account of their sufferings and requested an, an investigation into their current condition as prisoners of war. The prisoners claimed that they had been, quote, very much compelled against our wills and interests and torn from our country, our family, our friends, and everything dear to us to perform a lengthy servitude in his majesty's navy to fight against his enemies, not our own, and risk our lives in defending the honor of the British flag for the last 20 years. They claimed that at the outbreak of war with the United States, they were pressured to accept British citizenship, which they refused, and were then sent on board to the prison hulk Crown Prince at Chatham. Although promised to be returned home if they produced documents proving their American citizenship, the men continued to languish in prison and asked the House to consider them, quote, as injured seamen and freemen too long from their native country. However, the, prison, the prisoners signed off on their petition, not as Americans, but as, quote, we the persons formerly serving in His Majesty's Navy. The petition, I think, reveals a mixture of appeals by the, by the prisoners that played upon the morals of the British officials, the prisoners' service to the British Royal Navy, as well as their loyalty to the United States to push for their own, agenda, own ends. These sources highlight that impressed Americans continue to navigate a contested status and space as men detained prior to the war as either impressed mariners or indeed volunteers in the Royal Navy, as well as being American prisoners and men deserving a special consideration given their service as they tried to reconcile their service with their desire to return home. The Treaty of Ghent brought an end to the War of 1812, but barely addressed the issue of impressment Indeed, the treaty hardly touched upon the supposed reasons for declaring war against Britain, and at least at sea, largely returned the status quo. The end of the war hardly brought immediate relief for American prisoners, however. For months after the signing of the treaty, British and American officials argued over who had responsibility to shoulder the cost of transporting the prisoners back to the United States. And by this stage, most had been sent to Dartmoor uh, Prison, uh, some 6,000. As already noted, many American prisoners, especially formerly impressed ones, were already frustrated at the perceived inactivity of the American government. In Dartmoor Depot, the, prison, the prisoners even held an effigy of Beasley on trial for perceived negligence towards them. Beasley, or rather his effigy, was found guilty and sentenced to hang, which was carried out from one of the prison barracks. The effigy was then burned and paraded around the depot. Matters came to a head, however, shortly after the prisoners almost rioted following the issue of stale bread in April, 1815. The next day, a group of prisoners tormented a guard by throwing a ball over the yard and asking the guard to retrieve it, only to throw the ball over again. When the guard gave up on retrieving their ball, the prisoners began to dig a hole in the wall, inciting alarm. After a tense and confused period of taunts by an increasingly uh, growing mass of prisoners, accompanied by the throwing of stones, violence erupted. A guard fired his musket, followed by the other guards, and the firing did not cease for another 20 minutes. By then, seven Americans were dead and over 50 wounded. Investigations were held by the British government, along with a joint inquiry by British and American officials, as well as the prisoners who held their own inquiry. Each reached a different conclusion as to how the violence, as to how the violence occurred, though the evidence was so contradictory that no clear culprit or reason for the violence has yet been clearly determined, even to this day. Still, the event spurred the British government into action to return the British prisoners as quickly as possible. And by the end of 1815, almost every American prisoner was back in the United States. For many who had been formally impressed, however, their return to the United States as citizens had been even more violent than their initial removal from it by the press gang. 
The Virginia Argus included what they claimed to be, quote, an authentic and well-written narrative, which claimed that half the prisoners at Dartmoor Depot and present at what became known as the Dartmoor Massacre were formerly impressed sailors from the Royal Navy. This was hardly the case, as by the end of the war, impressed Americans made up less than a quarter of the prison population. Still, the editors sarcastically noted that, quote, this fact shows in glaring light the veracity of the British and federal leaders in constantly averring that there have been very few Americans impressed. In effect, Dartmoor Depot, or Dartmoor Prison, I should say, was becoming a focal point for political and public discourse on British atrocity, post-war reparation, and partisan politics. In the meantime, the first of many prisoner accounts published after the war began to appear. One of the earliest was a short pamphlet titled A Description of Dartmoor Prison, published in Philadelphia in 1815. It featured a short overview of the prison before providing testimonies concerning the shooting, which it described as, quote, a transaction unexampled in the history of civilized warfare. The pamphlet then included a copy of the prisoner's report into the shooting, followed by an extract from the journal of Charles Andrews. The extract, the extract described how in the midst of the violence, one British soldier was found inside barrack three, having been lighting uh, the lamps when the shooting started showcasing what Andrews claimed was, quote, the dignity of the American character. Uh, the prisoners let the soldier go in spite of desires for revenge because, quote, Americans never murder their prisoners and his life is thus spared to distinguish between the humanity of a British soldier and that of an American sailor. Finally, the pamphlet ended by providing unnamed remarks and anecdotes allegedly from other prisoners, which claimed that half the men imprisoned at Dartmoor were formally impressed. However, quote, the prisoners never despaired for a moment of, of the cause for which they suffered captivity. They rejoiced at all the American victories, though they often incurred the agent's displeasure. They had public orations on the 4th of July, and they never forgot for a moment the dear land of liberty. Uh, again, this kind of sentiment overlooks the, uh, the suspicion and scorn that I mentioned earlier that was directed towards our prisoners who arrived from the Royal Navy, uh, as well as um, the the uh, sort of amb ambiguity that many of these men had towards their own sense of loyalty to the United States. Another work published in 1816 by an unknown author titled Dartmoor Prison or a Faithful Narrative of the Massacre of American Seamen added yet another volume that repeated the claim that half the men in the prison when the shooting occurred were formerly impressed sailors who had refused to fight against their country. Another account, a concise narrative of the barbarous treatment experienced by American prisoners published in 1816, featured a narrative of an unnamed prisoner claiming to have served on the privateer Dolphin. The first half of the narrative takes place in Barbados and mostly describes what the author witnessed there, such as a British sailor being brutally flogged and an impressed American refusing to continue serving in the Royal Navy. He then narrated the brutal treatment received by prisoners on their way to England, where he claimed to have been detained on board the prison hulks at Portsmouth and Plymouth before being transported home. There is, however, a little evidence to validate this account. Still, for some former prisoners, there was no greater act of brutality, except perhaps for the Dartmoor massacre, in their recollections than of the treatment towards formerly impressed men who tried to surrender themselves rather than fight their fellow countrymen. Ned Myers provided an anecdote of three formerly impressed Americans who were flogged after surrendering, after surrendering themselves. The treatment of these men led Myers to conclude that, quote, it, is, it surely is bad enough to be compelled to fight against a foreign country without being flogged for not fighting when they happen to be one's own people. For myself, I was born of, bear, of German parents in the British territory, it is true, but American was and ever has been the country of my choice. Samuel Leach, uh, claimed that just prior to an engagement between the HMS Macedonian and the USS United States, that a number of sailors came forward as Americans, but were told by their officers to either remain at their stations or face execution. One, John Card, Leach described as, quote, braver seaman as ever trod a plank, who was threatened with execution if he did not fight. Such an unjust command, as Leach described it, is more disgraceful to the captain of the Macedonian than even the loss of his ship. Neither of these men, however, it must be pointed out, suffered impressment themselves, uh, nor were they uh, initially uh, American uh, citizens, but rather had come from uh, the British Royal Navy. <clears throat> these retrospective accounts also failed to acknowledge the suspicion and scorn, as I mentioned earlier, directed at prisoners who had served in the Royal Navy by their fellow countrymen. Seizing on both their own experience as prisoners 
as well as an already emerging image of impressed sailors, many of these post-war accounts claimed to give voice to impressed sailors, although hardly of the authors had themselves been impressed or had even um, been in British service. Indeed, it seems for some like Leach, in fact, fabricated accounts of American sailors surrendering themselves and being flogged, or at least threatened with a flogging for refusing to do service. And a lack of accounts from sailors who were actually pressed in the British service suggests a continued stigma concerning those who had fought for the British either willingly or under duress. Read carefully, these post-war accounts still provide some lingering disdain for prisoners who had served in the Royal Navy. Charles Andrews, for example, blamed an incident of a, blamed, of a betrayed escape attempt on a former serviceman in the Royal Navy named William Bagley, and even named his home state in his published account, likely uh, in the hopes that someone would read it and possibly try and uh, take their revenge on Bagley. The man who had betrayed the prisoners, however, was an American privateersman named Alfred Cooper. It was far easier, it seems, for Andrews to, to blame Bagley in his post-war account than a man who had served uh, in the United States throughout his entire career. Nonetheless, some accounts did emerge from men who had served in the Royal Navy. Joshua Penny devoted the majority of his narrative to justifying his service in the Royal Navy, into which he claimed to have been pressed. He declared that impressment was akin to slavery and stressed his acts of resistance towards his captors that included enduring a flogging for protecting a group of American sailors who planned to desert from the Navy. Naval records, however, dispute Penny's claim and also suggest that he entered into the Royal Navy as a volunteer. James Durand wrote a similar narrative of British oppression and American resistance, stressing that when he refused to do service against his country, he was placed in irons and threatened with an execution. Again, naval records dispute um, Durand's claim of punishment and suggest that he also was a volunteer. By the 1830s, the image of impressed sailors had to compete with yet another emerging national symbol. This period witnessed a surge of maritime literature alongside paraphernalia that celebrated the maritime achievements of the United States, linking the cultural development of the Republic to the exploits of its mariners, especially its officers. The experience of imprisonment hardly fitted with this national euphoria, and even the Dartmoor massacre effectively faded from national consciousness, with many preferring instead to focus on the individual exploits of commanders in action rather than sailors who had been uh, prisoners and also overlooked the broader impact of a war which had nearly brought the United States to ruin. Nonetheless, the image of impressed American sailors continues to linger, although ebbing and flowing in appeal and popularity over the decades. The image of the suffering impressed sailor remains common in many scholarly and popular works, though as highlighted here, these men could and did exercise a significant degree of agency. Uh, this slide is an engraving uh, depicting an attempted impressment of American sailors by a British officer. Um, and as you can see from the image, the American sailors are very clearly uh, ready to resist uh, by violence uh, the impressment if necessary. As I said before, this was not a particularly common uh, occurrence. Some men continued to serve well into the war in the hopes of prize money before declaring their American citizenship. Others carefully chose the moment of surrender in order to avoid battle. Some of these men even chose to return to British service or simply threw their lot entirely in with the British. Even as prisoners of war, former servicemen of the Royal Navy struggled to gain trust and acceptance as Americans and even struggled with their own sense of loyalty to the United States. Ironically, although the lead up to the War of 1812 and the Dartmoor Massacre propelled impressed sailors and the experience of prisoners of war to the forefront of national consciousness in the United States, few of these men actually lent their voices to discussions over what it meant to be an American suggesting a form of seen but not heard on the part of the American public and politic towards these men. Indeed, post -war accounts, in post-war accounts, the image of suffering Americans who were pressed into service but continued to resist their British uh, officers and who refused to serve against their country endured and even shaped popular depiction of impressments and the War of 1812 to this day. However, as discussed here, the actual experience of these men was far more complex and their motives and choices far more varied. Thank you. fascinating paper. I'd like to open up for uh, questions. Yeah. yeah, hi. Thank you for that, Peter. That was really great. I really enjoyed it. Now, there was a quote you had from, I think it was Madison, and he was talking about, he, he, plur he pluralized it uh, about the impressment of uh, 
sailors and took, and he talked about the impressment uh, in other navies. Do you, how much impressment went on outside of the British Royal Navy? I mean, were the Spanish and French doing it as well, or do you know? Yeah, so especially by uh, the Revolutionary Wars, basic, uh, many uh, of the belligerents had their own, I guess, form of impressment, um, although it was very, very um, varied. I think the French had a, a bit of a longer history of kind of conscripting sailors. They had a, a kind of register of sailors who could be conscripted. Um, I think that the um, United Provinces had a form of uh, impressing sailors by effectively using their debts to force them uh, to serve uh, in, in the Navy. Uh, and some of them would deliberately um, offer to, to, to put up a sailor um, in, a, in an expensive and lavish room um, in, a, in an inn uh, and then demand the next day for um, repayment. And then, and then when they inevitably couldn't repay that, they would then ship them straight off to the Navy to serve. So it did certainly take place uh, and American sailors did in some instances serve in um, Spanish vessels, for example. Um, however, the, for the most part, it was um, the British uh, impressment that took uh, most of the limelight for obvious reasons. It was the, the most common one for the American sailors experienced. Uh, but also I think that what Madison is reflecting there is that the, the idea of impressment um, really went counter to what were um, considered to be sort of a, a emerging American sort of notions of, of liberty and freedom, uh, even though the United States Navy itself also impressed sailors, uh, both during the War of Independence and even during the War of 1812. Um, but I think that's why he pluralizes that idea of foreign navies in general. Mm. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question in the chat uh, from Nancy. How could Americans be impressed by the British during the War of 1812? Were, where were Americans exposed to British? I assume Royal Navy presses weren't roaming the streets of American ports. No, so they basically, uh, quite a lot of impressment actually took place at sea, even though uh, we often see the depiction of it taking place um, in, in London. Um, quite often um, it was a policy that ships returning, uh, merchant ships returning could uh, be subject to a press gang, um, except uh, but outgoing ships couldn't. And so during the war, uh, when ships were stopped, um, uh, uh, press gangs from the Royal Navy would step on board uh, a British vessel um, and, would and would say, well, so-and-so is a, a British subject. And because quite a lot of uh, American sailors had decided to serve in the British merchant service um, for um, pay or for other reasons, many of them ended up uh, in, uh, in the, um, the Royal Navy. Uh, also, some were impressed straight from the decks of the United States Navy um, as well, uh, and some were taken on board um, American privateers and were then told uh, that they were uh, British subjects, uh, and if they effectively didn't decide to take their lot in with the Royal Navy, they could face an execution as a traitor. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Perhaps I might ask uh, a question. Um, you mentioned that there were quite a large number of African-American uh, uh, prisoners of war. Do you have any sense whether African-Americans found it easier to demonstrate their, or to have their Americanness accepted, whether, uh, uh, whether race played a, a, a role in presumption of, of, of Americanness or, or, or not? Mm. Um, that's almost a whole other talk. Um, Nicholas Guyant's recent book um, actually looks exactly at that. Um, so basically, um, the answer is kind of yes and no. Uh, so often, so to look at Dartmoor Prison in particular, what happened there, the uh, white American prisoners actually demanded segregation from uh, black prisoners. Um, but what ended up occurring was that because there was such a large amount of African-American prisoners arriving, they effectively formed uh, their own community within the prison that was separate from uh, the, the, the white prisoners uh, and that actually became quite a successful community. They ran 
Um, they ran classes there. They performed theatre. Uh, they charged prisoners to attend the theatre. They had a, a, a casino in the barrack as well. Uh, and we know from a lot of journals uh, from prisoners at the time that they uh, basically enjoyed spending time in what was considered, you know, the, the black barrack in spite of what was uh, on paper at least segregation. Um, but once they got back to the United States, many of them in post-war accounts basically portrayed um, the black community as being um, run through brutality um, and a sort of authoritarian um, sort of society that was incapable of exercising sort of democratic principles. Um, so to a certain extent, yeah, there was actually quite a lot of um, uh, African-American agency in certain instances. Uh, by the end of the war, that was basically being whitewashed. Uh, there were, uh, uh, I did come across instances of uh, a lot of particularly Southern uh, white Americans ending up in prisons uh, with African Americans and actually gaining sympathy for um, a lot of African American prisoners, especially once they witnessed sort of a flogging of, of other white prisoners and kind of made a connection to slavery, although whether or not they actually came to oppose slavery, I don't know. Um, but then there were also other instances of, of, of as I said before, of, of white uh, Americans basically saying, well, all these African-Americans are just going to re-enlist in the Royal Navy anyway. They can't really be trusted. So it's really a bit of both. It, it's a very ambiguous space. Interesting. And on that issue of, um, of relations within the prisons, um, you mentioned that, um, uh, that uh, uh, American sailors in Malta being harassed by French and Italian um, uh, prisoners of war. Uh, am I missing some great Maltese American rivalry <laughs> that failed to pick up on them? What, what's going on there? Um, yeah, so there's there's actually quite a number of examples of, uh, I mean, I guess the sort of the, the common image that we get of, of prisoner of war facilities, um, especially in a lot of Hollywood movies, is kind of solidarity amongst prisoners versing, you know, their guards. And I guess in particular, sort of what comes to mind is a lot of depictions of captivity around the Second World War, either in things like The Great Escape or even comedies like Hogan's Heroes or whatever else. Um, in this particular instance, there was um, quite a lot of coll um, collusion and cooperation between prisoners um, and guards in Plymouth. Um, the guards and even officers helped to smuggle uh, a printing press on board one of the prison hulks and the prisoners then printed counterfeit dollars that they then handed to the guards who would then go and spend it all and they get, came up with this whole black market thing. Wow. Uh, another officer used to take a group of prisoners out on a out on a, on a boat behind the prison hulk where no one could see them and they'd go fishing and then he would sell the fish at the market and they'd split the profits up. Um, so there was often quite a lot of collusion uh, and even cooperation and networks form. And Obadiah Stevens, whose journal I mentioned there, he talks quite, from, quite fondly of the British uh, prison doctor that he encounters and sort of names him as a, as a source of um, relief, not just medically, but also as a, as a friend who he confided in, but also as someone who supplied him with information about news concerning the war and the outside world. Um, whereas when it came to um, encounters between other prisoners, particularly of other nationalities, there was often quite a lot of rivalry, uh, but also cooperation. Um, there were some instances where when Americans would celebrate the 4th of July, the French prisons would also participate, but then they'd get into fights because the French would be there claiming that Americans owed their liberty to the French, uh, whereas the Americans would be saying, well, no, it was, it was all us. And so there was quite a number of rights that took place off of these celebrations um, as, as well. Um, but, and in some instances, they were also se forcefully segregated by the, the, the British because they just could not cooperate. Other questions? Uh, yeah, hi, hi, Sasha. Hi, Peter. Uh, thanks for the talk, Peter. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. I haven't um, haven't come across this period of history before, or this aspect of it, anyway. Um, certainly not in any Hollywood movies that I've come across, anyway. Uh, but um, to to think that there were so many Americans in the British Navy during that period of time is is a real surprise to me. So thanks for highlighting that uh, that aspect of it. Uh, for technical reasons, I missed the first five minutes of your talk, so my, my question might be uh, one you've already answered, but um, you, you uh, gave figures through your talk of 6,000 or whatnot. Um, do you have a, a feel for roughly how many Americans did end up serving in the British Navy? Uh, overall or just in this period? During that period. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so the general estimates are between six to 10,000. Uh, the reason why that there's such a big gap is because it's just very, very difficult to um, track accurate numbers uh, because everyone's sort of claiming different nationalities and, and, and claiming um, different loyalties. And also it's sort of, you know, the British aren't too inclined to investigate too deeply into, into who's who um, for quite obvious reasons. Um, and also in some instances, even the Americans aren't, but it's also just a, a lack of um, a documentary trail, really, uh, because bureaucracy at this time, particularly in the United States, was still sort of evolving and, and, and sort of still trying to figure out how it was going to function and work. Um, so you really just don't know. Um, I suspect that it would probably be maybe in the, in the closer to the 10,000 mark, uh, because I think that figure focuses solely on uh, sailors who claim to be impressed or those who actually sought to be, um, to be seen as Americans. It doesn't include those who decide to just serve out their whole time uh, in, the, in the Royal Navy, which, um, which you know, there, were, there were at least quite a number of those. Um, and that we know from the discharge papers at the, end of, at the end of the war of men who basically were discharged from the Navy and said, can I get a passage back to the United States? And they're like, why do you want that? So I'm actually from Virginia or I'm from wherever else. So there were certainly quite, um, quite a number who would not have been included in that data anyway. That, that's a huge number. That, that's, that's quite a staggering number. Um, it, in, in that context, roughly how many would serve on each ship? Are we talking 100, 200 would normally sail on a British ship? Um, that one, there's no, I, I don't think any real way to determine that. It was highly varied, uh, especially because there was such a heavy degree of fluidity in terms of sailors deserting, being um, transferred between different ships. Um, so you have instances where you'll find quite a significant group of sailors who claim to be Americans on board uh, a British warship. In other instances, there's maybe only one or two. In other instances, there's none whatsoever. So it was very, 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 I mean, the, the Royal Navy itself by this stage was the largest Navy uh, in the world, hundreds and hundreds of ships, um, um, over 100,000 personnel. Uh, so even though 10,000 Americans is quite a lot, it wasn't, you know, in, in terms of uh, percentage wise, it wasn't really numbered any more than say about 10% of the overall Royal Navy. Uh, and of course there were uh, other sailors from other nationalities who served in the Royal Navy from uh, Portugal, Spain, even some French sailors served in the Royal Navy uh, during, during, during the war. Some, I believe actually served with Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar uh, in, in, in the Royal Navy. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's quite a mixed environment there. Um, but again, it's so variable between each ship. You'll find some that are, that are, that are very, very highly multicultural and multinational, and you'll find others that are just straight up, uh, full of British sailors. Oh, that's great. Thanks for bringing it up, uh, Peter. It's a very interesting topic. Thank you. Okay. We have time for one more question. Uh, perhaps I might uh, uh, jump in uh, then, because um, I did have one I was very, very keen to ask, which is, you've spoken a lot about Americans trying to assert their Americanness, but I'm wondering about British people trying to assert their Americanness in order to escape having to fight. Mm. Is there any resentment amongst the American prisoners of people who turn up in these prisons who are basically not really Americans, but have bits of paper? Yeah, so um, again, there would always be another talk. Um, there are, so the most common one of that is um, one of the people I mentioned beforehand, Samuel Leach. He's actually, uh, he was actually a British subject um, who got his uh, commission uh, in the Royal Navy actually by uh, patronage through one of uh, Winston Churchill's relatives uh, way back when. Uh, and he served on the Macedonian during its action with the USS United States. He then deserted, uh, the, the British lost that particular battle. Uh, so he then deserted from the Macedonian um, when it arrived in um, New York, I think it was. Uh, basically wandered America aimlessly, trying to make a living. Um, basically joined up the with the United States Navy of all things. Uh, was then captured by the British and then ended up in um, South Africa actually, at Cape Town. Uh, we only really have his 
um, post-war memoir to go on. So it does have to be taken with a grain of salt. And he is very, very suspicious in terms of how he depicts um, the enga initial engagement between Macedonia and the United States. He's very quick to sort of claim, even though he was never impressed in the service, he volunteered and wanted to join the Royal Navy, but he's sort of clear about, well, I wanted to join, but once I was in there, I had no choice. The officers were horrible, even though we know that um, his by the uh, logbook of the, of the ship, his, again, his commander was not prone to a flogging, to flogging sailors or anything. Um, but he sort of plays up this very intense, oppressive atmosphere by the officers and uses that as his reason for joining. And then he claims, basically, once he joined the United States, he sort of hid his identity, but gradually it sort of came out. But he actually uh, received a lot of assistance from uh, a lot of the American sailors who gave him information to try and make him appear as American. Um, he sort of tried to dress himself as an American. Americans had a very sort of particular hairstyle that was sort of like in a, in a ringlet sort of thing that British sailors didn't have. So he styled his hair in a particular way. Um, he didn't have a protection certificate, um, but basically he used sort of this knowledge that he gained from other sailors to sort of claim, oh yeah, I'm from Virginia, this town where this person lives and sort of verbally talk his way through uh, the British prison system. Uh, and ended up then back in England when he was transported. And then, and, and then it was actually the Admiralty that wrote him down as an American, which sort of made his identity as an American official. Uh, and from that stage, he then returned to the United States um, and actually became a pretty successful merchant businessman. So there were certainly men like that. Um, for the accounts that I've seen, uh, it does seem that they were pretty readily accepted. Um, but I have little doubt that that needs to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, and I think that really that acceptance would probably have been borne out more of an idea of, um, you know, well, we're taking these guys from the British Royal Navy yay to us rather than an actual, like, feeling of solidarity um, with, with, uh, with any British sailors. Interesting. Okay, so please uh, join me in thanking Peter for an absolutely fascinating uh, paper. Uh, this is our last seminar for uh, 2022. But be sure to check your your emails and various other feeds for our 2023 lineup, which I'm sure will be you know uh, uh, also be fabulous. Until then, thank you all and have a great weekend.